Ah, <sighs> finally. Well, now that this whole thing's over, I, I suppose I can go touch some grass. Well, I guess I should uh, spin the wheel first. What's up? Welcome back to Close Chronology Examination number four. Today, we are going to be finding out what artists we're covering in CCE4. God, it took way too long to work out Aretha, and uh, I've eliminated all the artists that I think would have too big of a discography. So let's just find out who the hell we're covering this month. Ah, oh, okay. Here we go. And spin that wheel. Spin that freaking wheel. Small faces. Number four of Close Grounds Examination will be on small faces. I like this. I, I like this one. Can't wait to talk about Ogden's Not Gone Flake. That was in GTA 5, by the way. Twelve seconds later. Alright, let's go touch some grass. <laughs> How long has it been? Welcome back to the Close Chronology Examination. I'm your host, C Does Gaming, and I'm back. I once again want to thank everyone who waited the 173 days for the Aretha video. There will be at least two other videos which I plan to come out within a month of this release. One of which will be the debut episode of a new yearly series. Of course, you viewers need to remember that I am still working on putting out my own music. And in line with my channel's name and previous content, some gaming stuff will be coming out this year. I have always been and will always be a gaming channel, but experiments and detours like this one are fun to make, and I will never confine my content, even if I never see a dollar of ad revenue. Speaking of not being rewarded for being different and inventive, today we're talking about Small Faces, which were a British pop group that started many movements they never got to be a part of. Their musical stylings were precursors to punk, they also invented many musical devices in their short time in the studio and were not the leading voices, but rather the silent inventors. Okay, fine. Who the hell are small faces? To answer that, we must go all the way back to 1965. The British invasion is in full swing, and a larger cultural revolution is on the brink of happening, as is an invasion of Vietnam. In a small guitar store in Manor Park in London, works a musician named Steve Marriott, in walks a local ma named Ronnie Lane, in pursuit of a bass guitar for a jazz band he's in. Ronnie buys the bass, he and Steve exchange conversation for a bit before they both go back to work, but Steve invites Ronnie over to his house to talk music. They decide to form a band and Ronnie invites a few of his friends in, these being Jimmy Winston to play organ and previous bandmate Kenny Jones to play the drums. These men are all around 20 years old, but none of them are taller than 5 foot 6, and they had that good old fashioned youthful inspiration to be famous, and popular people were called faces in the 60s. So they decided on the name Small Faces after those two factors. They played in a few London clubs, singing blues and R&B standards with a loud, aggressive twist. After indulging in the underground scene, they were signed to Decca Records by Don Arden mere months after being founded. The singles What You Gotta Do About It and I've Got Mine are the first recorded material. The band even got a chance to play themselves in a film, Dateline Diamonds. I've Got Mine was planned to be released alongside the movie, but they delayed the movie so the song became a standalone single. Jimmy Winston left Small Faces over arguments between the manager and Jimmy's brother. Oh no, where are they going to find another short mod who's also a musician and wants to be famous in London? Ian McLagan replaced Jimmy on keyboard duties. This new lineup recorded the third single, Sha La 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 Lee, written by one of Elvis' songwriters and put it out in 1966. It got to number three on the UK singles chart and the stage was set for the first album, which they would record at IBC Studios. Let's see what they got. This is fine. DP albums by artists are usually only fine, showcasing the sound of their ambition, but not so much their ability. Quite often, these artists have just gotten out of being raised either by parents or later in life by underground clubs and other bands, and while they are ready to show what they have to the world, they often have a rough final product. Other times, artists will know exactly what they want to sound like and make music about, and what they want to sing for. This album is somewhere in between. 
which is quite rough. Not true love rough, but still quite rough. The guitar and bass are played with heavy distortion, the organ is wailing at some points, the drums are frantic. Steve Marriott often sounds like he's screaming and there's an abundance of shouting in the background. But it works. It could even be cited as an inspiration to punk rock as there's ever-present energy and the record is filled with bangers. Right from opener shake, you can hear a DIY approach to recording. It is also a Sam Cooke cover. On this entire album, Steve's vocal delivery is abrasive and passion-filled. Like on Come On Children, which has a breakdown where he does some vocal improv and interpolates You Are My Sunshine. You are my only sunshine. Yeah. It is impossible to ignore the influence Blues has on this band, like on You Better Believe It. What You Gonna Do About It was their first big single. As a soaring guitar and tight backing vocals, it makes for a fine single with a duration of under two minutes. It's perfect for radio play. They even do a bit of sunshine pop and it's too late. The keyboard playing here is usually subdued, but there are some tracks with virtuosic organ, like the relentless instrumental Own of Time. Their version of the Muddy Water song, You Need Loving, is a loud and hard rocking sing-along that would eventually become the basis for Led Zeppelin's Whole Lotta Love. I ain't fooling. Sha La 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 Lee is a fine song that was their biggest hit for a while, which they resented as it is a bit further from their soul influenced proto punk sound and they felt it didn't represent them well. While the album isn't completely polished musically, the production is all here and lets the intricacies of their playing show. I wish there was a bit more diversity in song keys, but as it is only 30 minutes long, the album ended before that really became a problem. Small Faces was released on May 6, 1966, a little over a year since Ronnie and Steve met at the guitar store. It was immediately met with high praise from critics and commercial success getting to number three on the UK album chart. They kicked off a lengthy world tour and the band were clearly in that Sigma grind set because they played a total of 218 shows that year. So that must've been exhausting. They were only being paid 20 pounds a week by Decca as Don Arden had collected all royalties. While Don was a fierce promoter and reputable manager, he sometimes took personal fees out for his extra work. And in the case of Small Faces, he believed that fee was every pound they ever made. In fact, when a young man by the name of Robert Stigwood asked the band behind closed doors to join his label, Don showed up with associates to his house and roughed him up. The band decided they would confront him. However, Ian McLagan was arrested for drug use so Don attempted to blackmail the band, promising Ian security from his parents finding out. When they refused the offer, Don attempted to convince Ian's parents that the whole band were frequent drug users. When he failed, the band realized they were in too deep and the only way out was to completely leave Decca and Don got to keep the rights to all recorded material. This actually influenced the band to take psychedelic drugs, which of course would lead to a change in their music. <laughs> There are other labels out there. Andrew Oldham offered Small Faces a place in his label, Immediate Records. Don Arden would eventually pay the majority of the band's royalties back, but we are a long way off from that. Just wait until you hear what he did upon hearing about this album. Anyway, Small Faces had already been recording new material since 1966, and it was time for it to see the light. One improvement found in this record is the addition of new instruments to their usual sound, like the acoustic guitar on Tell Me Have You Ever Seen Me and Become Like You, the harpsichord on Feeling Lonely, Bob goes on the instrumental Happy Boys Happy, piano on Things Are Going To Get Better, Tiffany on Show Me The Way, and brass on the zany All Our Yesterdays. Another point of interest is how they reined in the loudest when experimental, like my favorite off this record, Green Circles. It has a honky-tonk piano sound and is the first outwardly psychedelic song of theirs with harmonious vocals, crashing drums, and random fidelity splicing in the last 30 seconds. It would eventually serve as the inspiration for Donovan's Hurdy Gurdy Man. Green circles, green circles. <laughs> Some other plant medicine influenced songs from here include the biggest hit, Get Yourself Together. It's a fine tune, stands by itself quite well, and has an unmatched energy. Something I want to tell you is Ronnie Lane's vocal debut, and his singing doesn't really work well with their style. The stylings of this album culminate in the closer, Eddie's Dreaming, having all the previously mentioned instruments and flutes. It also contains one of the first ever hidden tracks committed to vinyl. 
My last few points I'd like to make is that there's much more diversity in key signatures on this album. There isn't a dull moment here. Every song is under three minutes, and it always kept me on my toes while I was listening. Overall, this is the defining point where Small Faces became something special. As this was a reintroduction of sorts, this album was named the same as their debut. Small Faces 67 was released on June 23rd, 1967, just as the summer of love was kicking off. They toured the world again, this time only performing 137 times this year. A few notable singles from this time were Here Come the Nice with its oblique vocal harmonies, Tin Soldier, and the biggest hit of their career, Ichiku Park. It is a psychedelic pop song about getting absolutely toked in a park and accidentally falling in love with the beauty of the earth. It's also the first ever song released by a British artist to have a flanger effect. But American Small Faces fans may remember this rollout a bit differently. In the 1960s, it was common for albums released by British bands to be repackaged for the US with different titles, covers, and track lists, usually swapping out the weaker songs from the albums with previous singles. So us Yanks got There Are About Four Small Faces, which had most of the songs from Small Faces 67 and the three aforementioned singles. What did Don Arden back on Decca think of this? He was furious and he saw success for the band coming, so he dropped an album of Small Faces demos from their time with Decca called From the Beginning to sabotage their success. It didn't exactly work out that way as it got to number 17 in the UK and Small Faces got to number 12 and number 25 in Australia. Today it's regarded as a B-sides record because of the circumstances of its release and because many of the songs would be seen later in their catalog. The Small Faces kicked off a tour of Australia and New Zealand in January of 1968, supporting The Who. From all accounts, it was a messy month involving insecticide, drug addiction accusations, gangs, Steve Marriott fighting heckler, and what was possibly the first ever completely trashed hotel room. that disaster, the band took a month off to recharge. While on a boat in the River Thames, Ronnie Lane and Steve Marriott look to the sky to see the moon in a quarter phase, during which the moon looks like half of it is missing. They together conceived an original fairy tale, but also the idea that it would be told through song, almost like it's an opera, but with rock. That'll never catch on. This was just a pipe dream at this point, but they already had a bunch of experimental songs recorded. However, because the band was touring so damn much, they only had enough material to fill up one side. And so they came up with the brilliant idea to put the entire fairy tale as one side-long epic, with the song serving more as chapters than standalone compositions, creating the first ever rock opera. I'll tell you about that later, but first I want to talk about the first side. You know, the first side of the album. The opening title track is an instrumental version of their song, I've Got Mine, but much slower and with an orchestra. Even though the song sounds like a lazy choice, it is a perfect stage setter for what will be an epic album, and the instrumental would prove to be useful in the future. Glyn Johns was brought on to produce this record, and he definitely works well with the radical sound, and his magic touch can be found everywhere within this album. Afterglow takes the psychedelic approach to rock and roll, and the result is a sweet love song that became a huge hit for them. It transitions into the equally good long goes and worlds apart. Rini is a weird song. It takes the surrealism with Steve Marriott doing a cockney accent and goes off the rails and lasts a little longer than I would have liked, but you could do much worse. Steve also does the cockney accent on the other big single, Lazy Sunday. I love this song as it is anthemic in its laziness and psychedelia. There are breakdowns that radically change the sonic landscapes throughout and it is a poetic musical statement inspired by a real family feud, even though it was put out as a single by immediate without the band's permission. Baker's song is about opening a bakery because you're hungry after working in a mine. Any metaphor this might be for escapes me, so I'll allow you to make up your own meaning. So yeah, it's clear that the small faces went psychedelic, but now I like to get into the good stuff. Are you sitting comfortable too square on your body? Then we'll begin. The second side of Ogden's Not Gone Flake is a 19 minute suite showcasing a young boy named Happiness Stan who one night sees the moon in its first quarter phase but Stan doesn't realize that. He thinks the moon is missing and sets out on a journey to find the missing half. He then meets a fly who was about to die from starvation and gives him some food that he packed. The fly then asks if there's anything he can do in return and Stan informs him of his quest. The fly then tells Stan that he does know of a powerful and wise man who can answer his questions and help him. 
so they set out to find this man. Stan harnesses magic power and, by some weird fairy tale logic, enables the fly to grow to an insane proportion so that he may carry Stan upon his back to this all-powerful man. After flying for seven days, they land, and Stan is given the promise of finding not only the missing half of the moon, but also the meaning of life. The man is revealed to be named Mad John, who is called that by his neighbors because of their disgust towards him. John takes Stan outside his home and shows him the full moon, as seven days have passed, may I remind you, and explains the phases. Then, John explains to Stan that life is just a bowl of all bran. The sweet and the album ends with the refrain No matter how stupid that last song is, the sweet is still quite the achievement and is one of the first of its kind. It would become the catalyst for a whole subgenre of rock progressive. There is some genius humor and lyricism on this album and there is even vast instrumentation to go along with it. Not only do they have harmonicas, a sax quartet, and a full orchestra at some point, the Small Faces are quite the pioneers with so many advancements from the previous two, you couldn't count them using two hands. The Small Faces utilize the following elements that soon everyone would use. Counter melodic bass lines, modal interchange, tempo change, time signature change, smoke and word narration from Stanley on wind, phasers, wob howl, gapless playback, insanely flashy drum playing, humor, surrealism, stereo panning, fake fade outs, and a general growth and technical ability on the part of all musicians, especially Ian McLagan, on the journey. All this adds up to be a classic project through and through, and I would have no problem calling this my favorite album of 1968 or of the band's entire discography. So, Small Faces put out Ogden's Not Gone Flake on May 24th, 1968. And even the rollout was eccentric. The award-winning packaging was done by Ian McLagan's art school friends, Nick Twiddle, Pete Brown, and Harry Willock, and was packaged in the large novelty tobacco tin with a die-cut album artwork on its cover. They literally started rolling off the shelves and were too expensive to manufacture consistently, but you can find original copies with the tin on Discogs for surprisingly low prices. Immediate records advertised the album with a spoof of the Lord's Prayer, which enraged a bunch of people, but this was satiated when the thing actually did come out. The band was smothered in critical praise. It spawned three hit singles. It got to number one in the UK, number six in Germany, and number 156 in the US their highest charting album here. The BBC even gave the band a chance to play the entire second side live on a broadcast. This truly feels like the moment that Small Faces left their mark on the world and created something that would inspire but get relatively less recognition. It's almost like you had to be there to understand. But for now everything's great. I'm sure there's absolutely nothing that could go wrong. God damn it. So while all this was happening, the Small Faces, particularly Steve, were growing frustrated. The constant shows, the labeling of them as a pop band, and the near impossibility of recreating Ogden's Not Gone Flake live, knowing full well what's their best work, was too much for the band. During a New Year's Eve performance on December 31st of 1968, Steve got fed up with the trajectory of the band and walked off stage mid-set. There were still the few shows the band were booked to do, so the remaining members would play their way through these before the band completely broke up in March 1969. What's interesting about this breakup is that the band effectively split into two separate bands. Steve Marriott immediately joined forces with Peter Frampton and a few other musicians from other UK bands to form one of the first ever supergroups, Humble Pie. They released eight albums together from 1969 until their breakup in 1975, and you probably know at least one song by them, as they actually had a few hits during their tenure. Steve Marriott then released a solo album in 1976. Afterglow was released as a single by Media after the band's breakup, and it had some success. But soon, in 1970, the other three members of Small Faces reunited with Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood from the Jeff Beck group, and they decided to name this band Faces. There's definitely some self-awareness here in choosing not to be known by their short stature. Faces would put out four albums until their respective breakup in 1975 as well, but Ronnie Lane left before most of that happened to start his own band, Slim Chance that also broke up in 1975. Upon hearing news of the synchronous breakups, Immediate re-released Ichiku Park as a single in December of that year, and convinced the Small Faces to reunite to make a video for the song. After that prolonged break from each other, Steve and the rest of the band must have realized that they didn't completely hate each other, so they reunited with the exact same lineup they had when they broke up. That's great. I'm sure there's absolutely nothing that could go wrong here. So Ronnie just left the band. God damn it.
Ronnie Lane left the band almost as soon as recording for this new album started. He was developing multiple sclerosis at this time and had a falling out with the other members. Probably one of those instances where after being away from something you didn't like for so long, you forgot how much you hated it. That ever happened to any of you? Brick Wills of Peter Frampton and Roxy Music fame replaced Ronnie on bass in 1976. The band was tired of immediate doing things like re-releases behind their back, so they broke things off and signed with Atlantic, which means three of the four artists I've talked about on this channel coexisted under the same parent record company. Does this mean the wheel works for Warner Music? Or does it mean I work for... You know too much to see this game. You are of no use to us anymore. What? You can't kill me. That's illegal. I know that dipshit. I'm Warner Music. I violate all four Geneva Conventions for a couple bucks. I am your god. No, you're not. You're just Dark Energy Guy with a Warner Music mask. I should have known. You may have foiled me this time, Zeta's game, but I shall be back the next time you dare to speak of Warner Music Group. Okay, buddy. You can go. You can leave now. Come on. No one wants you here. Bye. Yeah, he sure is a dick, isn't he? Oh my god, who the hell are you? I'm you from the future! The darkness is closing upon us and the Dark Lord is upsetting the balance between yes and no! I've come to warn you! Who's the Dark Lord? Is he that guy? No, that's just Dark Energy Guy. He's already been in your Aretha video. And he's not bad, but you don't know that yet. Shit. What the actual fuck? Are you insane? You can't be serious. There is no Dark Lord and whatever balance there is, it's perfectly fine. They warned me about him. Well, that may be true now, but beware the day the cabinet under the stairs opens. God damn it, I lost my eye thanks to you. I'll have to travel back in time again to fix this. You can go now. Bye. You can do it. Bye. Okay, so to anyone who doesn't know what all that was, don't worry, as it will take a long time for any of this to make sense. Even I don't know what's going on, as I've just been visited by these people for the first time. Whatever, I'll continue talking about small faces, but uh, I have an uneasy feeling about this. Anyway, this album sucks. It does start off boldly with high and happy, but fortune may not favor the bold here, as its lyrics come off as pro-cocaine abuse, and although it may be satirical, it doesn't sound that way. Some other examples of bad songwriting include the following. Never Too Late sounds like it was about one minute long originally, and the other three minutes were added to fill time. Find It is where they break six minutes. It is their attempt at disco. You already know how that's gonna go. Most of the lyrics sound like they are written in the amount of time the song goes on for, and it is repetitive to the point of boring. I don't see anybody in a real New York City club dancing to this, or the other disco song, Driving Romance. Looking for Love is about how the character in the song wants a romantic partner, and one of the three reasons provided is that she could cook him breakfast. Can you imagine if this album was released today? Smiling in Tune is a stupid closer on a stupid album. It goes on for way too long, and it references some earlier songs of theirs in a way that seems pandering, pointless, and pretentious. Steve Marriott also puts on a southern US accent. Never mind, I take it back. This is their greatest album. Jokes aside, there isn't a single good song off this one I recommend you listen to, besides maybe the title track, as many of these are about drinking alcohol, drugs, careless sex, and all of them are shallow and tasteless. This is such a letdown after the charming and whimsical Ogden that it saddens me to see such a quick descent into the atrocity that is Playmates. You could blame the time gap, the absence of Ronnie Lane, or the other members living the rock star lifestyle. Whatever the reason is, it's bad, and I'd even say it is the worst album we have covered on this channel so far. If there's any other artist work which I've discussed previously that I could compare this to, I would choose Full Circle by The Doors. Both of these albums are necessary in their creation and have laughably bad moments, though the moments where the band feels like they're at least trying appear a lot more on the Doors album than this one. I'm not sure why, but Playmates was released in August of 1977. The album charted nowhere and was universally despised by critics. After some touring, and I say that in the lightest way possible, they brushed themselves off and they tried again. But while they were touring, they added a fifth member on guitar, Jimmy McCulloch, who had recently left Paul McCartney's group Wings. With more minds at work, this had the potential to be a better album, so that their discography could end on a relatively high note. Nope, the end result was somehow even worse! 
Once again, it starts off promising with Over Too Soon. It has some pristine production, fine organ playing, and a nice sing-along chorus. And it's the only good song here. Everything else is the same as Playmates, with maybe an actual direction and slightly better production. The lyrics may not be as tasteless, but they are equally shallow and basic. Brown Man Do sucks. I know this is supposed to be a supportive song for African British communities that began to form in some cities over there in the late 70s, but it doesn't really come off like that. It sounds less like saying that African British people uphold society by doing hard jobs, and more like saying that African British people do hard jobs that everyone else doesn't have to. The last song I'd like to call attention to is Closer, Filthy Rich. <laughs> I built a dirty great house and have half a dozen cars. It is about wanting a filthy bitch with posthumous tits. I built me own filthy bitch. She'd have a elegant class with Bitsy Gainer's arms and posthumous tits. This is the worst song ever written. Don't listen to it. You will get dumber. So yeah, this album sucks. It didn't need to exist, and when it's not offensive, it's just boring. 78 in the Shade was released in September of 1978, once again loathed by critics and detested by anyone with ears. It doesn't help that the mod subculture Small Faces rose from was becoming the laughing stock of the UK as the punk scene was emerging. They did nothing to promote this album, and after 78 in the Shade came out, the band broke up for good this time. Here's what happened to each member after Small Faces disbanded. Steve Marriott and some other members of Humble Pie reunited in 1990 and put out two albums. Then in 1983 he formed another band that was sometimes called Small Faces, sometimes called Humble Pie, whatever sold more tickets, and he stopped his life as a double agent and broke up both bands in 1983, and he would release some compilations and live albums until his death in 1991 at age 44. Ronnie Lane released solo music and toured as a guest act. He even briefly reunited with the Faces in 1986 for a one-off performance and did charity concerts for multiple sclerosis research, before he died of pneumonia onset by the disease himself in 1997 at age 51. Kenny Jones replaced Keith Moon in The Who, and that's probably why you already knew of him before you watched this video, and he would remain in The Who until 1989. He formed a band with Paul Rogers of Bad Company fame in 1990 called The Law, and released a mildly successful album with them in 1991. Then created his own band with Rick Wills and others called the Jones Gang, who are still together. Rick Wills initially was planning on living the rest of his life out modestly after contributing some bass to David Gilmour's first solo album, but then Foreigner offered him a spot in their band to replace Ed Gagliardi on bass. I probably don't need to tell you this, but Foreigner enjoyed a ludicrous amount of success until the early 90s, and coincidentally, that's when Rick left the band. In 1993, he joined Bad Company, put out two albums with them in the 90s, left them to join the Jones Gang, and stayed with them until he retired from music in 2017. Jimmy McCulloch immediately formed a supergroup called Wild Horses with Kenny Jones, Brian Robertson from Thin Lizzy, and Jimmy Bean from Rainbow. And then both X Small Faces Fleft and Wild Horses would cycle through many artists and only put out two albums before dissolving in 1981. But the real tragedy here was when Jimmy McCulloch died of alcohol and morphine poisoning in 1979 at the age of 26. I saved Ian McLagan's career summary for last because his is definitely the most interesting. Not only did he have an expansive studio career from 1979 to 2014, with nine studio albums and a live album, he spent quite a bit of time in the studio and played keys on records of Mick Taylor, Joe Cocker, Melissa Etheridge, Jackson Brown, Bob Dylan, Chuck Berry, Bonnie Raitt, Bruce Springsteen, and John Mayer. The rights to all the Small Faces recordings remain in the hands of whomever released them, but Ian did approve Ogden's Not Gone Flake to be used in the trailer for Grand Theft Auto V. I wanted to retire from what I was doing, you know? From that. Which may be the most influential and overall best game of the 2010s. The song was also put into the in-game radio station Los Santos Rock Radio, and Humble Pie got to have a song in the game too, with 30 Days in the Hole. So, Small Faces. They're alright, for a band that only put out five albums, they have a very interesting history, even if they serve more as a springboard for other, more successful bands. If you want to get into the Small Faces, obviously start with Ogden's Not Gone Flake. Maybe check out Small Faces 67 if you're interested. I had a comparatively relaxed time making this video, and I sure hope you all liked it, even with Dark Energy Guy's 
intrusion. In the description of this video, I link their Spotify profile, a playlist containing every song from every CCE I ever made. I also made a playlist of every song I mentioned in this video as a neat little best of experience by subreddit r slash vloghouse and my patreon too. Please consider donating if you like this video and would enjoy seeing a video like this but with better production quality. If you don't feel like giving money to a 91 subscriber 16 year old nobody then I will have to thrive on your pressings of the like button, the subscribe button, and the notification bell. Please feel free to suggest artists for me to cover in the comments. You can leap into a chronology but you can't make me examine it. CCE5 will be out eventually but there's also gonna be a little uh, new series coming out premiering before that, but in any case, I hope to see all 91 of you next time. <laughs> <laughs>